Ashish, before we start? Yes. Uh, thank you, Mara. Uh, hi, everybody. This is Smriti. I'm the Director of Programs in Tax Media. And I'm delighted to welcome uh, people from 21 states in three other countries. And um, we are now in our 10th week of this program. It's been wonderful to see um, this, this, uh, this community grow. And uh, I will hand over now to Dr. Moira Lai, a senior palliative care physician associated with India for many, many years, and now the medical director of CARDIS. Uh, in, um, and and uh, she's also been, she's, she's worked in several um, incredibly difficult uh, circumstances across the world. Uh, experience in humanitarian crisis. And I can't think of a better person to start things off this week. Um, also facilitating with Moira Sahani, uh, a consultant neurologist with Hindu Hospital in Bombay. And uh, present in the in the room today are other members. Moira and uh, welcome everybody. Thank you so much. And it truly is a pleasure. I've been watching those names coming up, your introductions, seeing how experienced many of you are, seeing that you're coming from a variety of places. I've seen from Chhattisgarh, Uttarakhand, from, uh, Man from Manipur, Nagaland, uh, from different parts of, of India, but including the Philippines also today, and Indonesia, and others who are coming on board. So this is our community of learning today. Because of the logistics, most of our shared learning will be through the chat function. Please do use that chat function. I am delighted that Dr. Roop is supporting me today. We, we, uh, during the week, you will see the facilitators support each other. So please keep that chat coming. Ideas, suggestions, responses to anything that I'm saying. Dr. Roop will kind of uh, summarize those and look at them. And today you have two presentations. So we will be a little tight. First of all, we'll give you a brief introduction to the overall course, and then we'll move into the main topic for today, uh, which is particularly looking at um, triage and decision making, some of the most tricky issues that we see. I want to just say a welcome to Christina joining us, who's been working in the Mercy Ships. I know that you've been working off Sen uh, Senegal and West Africa, so you're also going to bring an African perspective. Uh, let me share my screen and then we can carry on and get started. So you should have uh, had the information in advance about the background for this course. If you haven't done, please look at get this link and put it straight in and download it because we want by the end of this week you to be comfortable with these resources, to be comfortable with how to use them. We'll bring in as facilitators our expertise. I have uh, more than 20 years expertise of working in India, in Uganda and other parts of Africa, including Sudan, and also in uh, Middle East, including Gaza. We'll bring those in, but we want everyone to bring in their situation. I just want to welcome the Indonesians particularly. My, I was born in, in uh, West Papua, so I have a little link with you there in Indonesia. We want to train and empower you learn from each other to manage both those who have COVID-19 infection but also the greater population who are affected by this pandemic particularly those who fall into the palliative care category those who are with existing mor morbidity some of the vulnerable populations and uh, the elderly and we also want to think about how we take care of ourselves as healthcare workers in this very challenging time and i'm aware that as we have this call today the numbers of course are showing that there are increasing challenges we have 10 uh, competencies i'm going to move over this this is all in your ebook really to come to uh, my apologies to come to this because our 10 competencies are all linked to these five domains which are identified as the five key domains that we need to be looking at in palliative care in general, but specifically during COVID-19. So we have triage and symptom control, where there's issues of goals of care and ethics and communication, and that's the topic of today's talk. And then we have symptom control, which will be tomorrow, particularly looking at the, the, the use of algorithms and the common symptoms that we're going to see. Management of distress, very interesting. That's going to come up later in the week. In between, we'll look at communication specifically and picking up issues from today. Manage management of distress takes in the psychosocial and the spiritual. And then end of life care, very important, whether that's happening in a hospital setting 
or in a palliative care setting or even at home, which is not so common in lower middle income countries as yet, but may yet come during this pandemic. And of course, support for the caregiver. This is the ebook that is supported by uh, PowerPoints and webinars. Those, so don't stop learning after this week. Keep learning, look at these resources. If you can prepare for the sessions, the more you prepare, the more you'll get out of them and be able to give to them. Some of you have done training, I see, uh, in Rishikesh, for example. You will already have some of this information. So therefore, please get involved in how we solve and address the challenges we'll bring in. And altogether, this is called the toolkit. These uh, lectures are to help you find your way through that toolkit and to learn together. And we're, we've already inside these, we're going to be using this split classroom model. This means you have information in advance to, and you have the information also for reference afterwards. So some of the theoretical concepts will be there. We won't necessarily discuss every theoretical concept in our sessions, but of course you can be asking questions. We'll be focusing more on how do we apply this in our particular settings? What are the things we need to know? We have seen people adopting and adapting these. We've seen our colleagues in Bangladesh translating into Bangla. We've seen colleagues in Kenya and Uganda and Nepal and Ghana using some of these tools and developing either the same algorithms or taking them further. Please contact us if you'd like to do that. I think you might know what palliative care is. We didn't ask you that. Uh, you've come on this course. Some of you, this might be the first time. Uh, in the chat, you can start to say what you think, what has struck you about what palliative care is. But we're talking about a continuum of care that is throughout a person's illness, particularly appropriate for those with chronic illness and what we now call serious health-related suffering. This is a new definition that was recently published. We're looking at quality of life, we're looking at holistic care, including end of life care, but not only end of life care. And we're looking at caring for patients and their caregivers and families. So that's the context we're talking about. We're not specifically talking about specialist care. And in fact, you can see from this definition that palliative care is everybody's business who are seeing people with chronic illness or with serious health related suffering. This is a humanitarian uh, pandemic. We, we are caught up in this across the world. It's common to all of us, although the experience of it is very much related to the resources we have and how our, our health systems and social systems are responding. But we have been looking already at where does palliative care fit in these humanitarian crises. These are some articles uh, that are useful. This is a WHO guide. So this pandemic is coming on top of that. And that's partly why these trainings are happening, because Kerala already had a group who was looking at how do we apply palliative care principles into a pandemic scenario, such as these here in the floods. This is Nepal's earthquake. This is an area I've been involved with, which is South Sudanese refugees in Uganda. And there's a fascinating and very helpful article in The Lancet from very good friends of ours who have summarized where they feel the key domains are. And what I was very pleased to see is the domains we chose for the trainings are exactly the same domains highlighted in this article. Communication and goals of care, symptom control, particularly for those not having uh, escalation in treatment. But we actually need to give some control to everyone. Psychosocial and spiritual care, so important that holistic issues are addressed. And we're seeing this even more and more as we see some of the mental health challenges uh, coming in our newspapers and so on. Of course, end of life care and staff support. We do have some very helpful documentation coming out from Centrally. Um, we can see, for example, the WHO has in the WHA has put palliative care into the case management structure and actually mentioned the elderly and those with comorbidities. Very important. And if you're in your setting need to argue for this, please refer to these documents. Tsunami of suffering is the word that is used in, in this Lancet article I mentioned. Let's just think of some of the vulnerable groups. These are refugee children who are in the Rohingya setting. These are prisoners, hugely problematic. This is a Latin American setting, but can you imagine the, the challenge of being in prison during this? What about uh, people who are migrant workers? These are migrant workers going back to Nepal. 
But here we see a refugee camp in, in Sudan where they are managing social distancing. So we're, we can learn actually from people in all settings. And of course, the elderly. In some way, this is being seen as a disease of the elderly, not just the elderly, but the elderly are particularly, um, particularly vulnerable. I see, Dr. Roop, that you've been asking about suffering, and I, I'm really pleased to see everybody's giving us the words. We need to have words in our own language and setting for how we explain suffering. I see many there in Urdu and Hindi, and people sharing from, what other languages do we have? Filipino, thank you. Pagdurusa? I'm not sure if I've got that one right, but thank you. Another one in Hindi. I think this is what's quite important, isn't it? In our heart languages, these words are not just one single word. It's a concept, it's an experience. And thank you for sharing those words. We are suffering. As a, as a world, we are suffering. What do we do to alleviate that suffering? And that is the core of palliative care. You can see in this picture some people who are doing practical things to alleviate suffering. And uh, this was particularly uh, helping migrant workers who are without transport, without food, being helped by their neighbours. And I just want to draw your attention to some of the things in this uh, statement. It's a, it's a post from Washington. It was a few weeks ago in the pandemic. But this was a surgeon alongside um, colleagues in, in emergency medicine saying, actually, you know what, we all need palliative care now because we need to minister to the stress of our patients. We need to think about existential or spiritual issues. We need to look at their priorities, make recommendations that are based on the reality of the situation. We need to bear witness. We need to make sure there's always something to be done. We need to make patients fear heard. Thank you for being part of that by joining this call. You're part of being the palliative care the relief of suffering um, agents in your setting. And this is something, again, we wrote, I wrote after a visit to Gaza about how palliative care brings in this concept of our own mortality and also our common humanity. That as we respond compassionately to the suffering that we see, we're doing that from a place of our own humanity. And in that space is where we are also, we can grow and we can be restored. And I think we'll talk particularly about some of these later. Uh, Raji is asking Christina how we pronounce things in Dutch. I think, Christina, you're our first Dutch person coming in. Lovely to see that. And uh, Rup is also asking us about bearing witness. So keep an eye as I'm talking on your, your um... okay. So, Rup, anything you want to say about those words people were mentioning before we go on to the next part of the talk? No, I think, um, hello, can you hear me? Yes, Dr. We can. Yeah. So, I, I uh, was quite impressed by the range of, uh, that everybody does know a word or two from another language. And I think we all need to uh, keep that in mind. Uh, but uh, uh, would you want to uh, explain a little bit more about bearing witness? Because that's uh, in some ways a little profound as well. A minute, Moira. Yes, shall we pick that up as we move through? I mean, bearing witness is the sense that you are acknowledging and seeing what is happening. Many times we want to go into a situation and make it better, solve the problem. And one of our challenges when faced by things that we can't solve is then to feel a little sense of panic that there's nothing we can do. So we veer between those two things. Bearing witness is saying, I see you, I hear you, you are a person in front of me. You are going through this difficult time and there's things I can do to support you. There's things I can do to listen to you and acknowledge what is happening. There's things I can do to ease the communication and to make sure the symptoms are well controlled and to help communication be as good as it can be. But these are all part and parcel of how we um, are at present, fully present, in the suffering of another person, rather than relying on our ability to do an intervention or to take a blood pressure. I hope that makes some sense. Yes, yes. Okay, and I noticed that my one of our colleagues was saying they're finding it distracting with the chat. I'll either put the chat on the other side, or we'll allow Dr. Roop for you mostly to be looking at the chat so yeah. that we don't make it difficult. We'll, yeah, we'll, we'll... Thank you uh, for yeah. that feedback. Okay, so into the other uh, part of the, the talk, really the main part of our session today is triage. 
And initially, this has been quite a stressful issue for people. How do we make decisions? So I want us to help us think of the principles of how we do that. And then also, we're going to look at a case scenario. This case scenario will follow us all through the week. And we'll start meeting this case scenario today. So our main uh, issues today are to look at the background for ethical decision making in the webinar. So we're not going to come into that so much. But today, how to balance those ethical issues to outline uh, an algorithm for managing triage in particular, looking at our case scenario, and to just think of how that impacts on our values. You can start putting in the chat what are the four principles. We're not going to go over them again, but I wonder if anyone can remember me. What are the four pillars of medical, medical ethics? It'd be great if you could have a look at that in the chat. Do download this book. Now, there's one other thing I'd like you to think about downloading. The Palicare app is produced in Bangalore. It's quite a simple app. It's free on Apple or, or iPhone, and it gives you good symptom control backup. So this will be useful for later sessions, but please think of download, downloading it. It's not specifically for children. It's more for adult, but it's very useful. And please think of downloading that and then referring to it when you're in your management settings. Okay, so the ethical principles. I see someone is, is putting them in nicely. Patient autonomy, beneficence, and perhaps there will be two more that come in. These are underpinning principles that help us when caring for patients at the end of life. They actually help us at any stage of our clinical decision making, but they become very acute when we have these more difficult decisions to make. They're not culturally dependent and they shouldn't be situationally dependent but they may have cultural or context implications. They are not, they are guiding principles, not laws, and uh, hopefully our legal settings, our legal frameworks in our countries will also back us up on these ethical principles. Sometimes that's more difficult than others. India recently changed their legal framework. So the question is, how do we apply these principles uh, while not um, losing the balance yeah because sometimes one principle can be difficult to balance against another someone wants a particular treatment but it's not available somebody a family member feels this should be right for their family member and yet medically we don't think it's in the best interests of the patient so that's when these things can feel as though there's some kind of conflict or balancing and we might even feel this is like a tightrope no longer uh, an easy balance but like a tightrope just going to look at the chat so we can see here. Yeah, we got all of the principles, fantastic. And I like that you put in futility. I'm going to ask the person who put in futility just to explain that on chat, chat for me. So is this a maze that we can't find our way through? Or are there some principles that can help us, some tools that can help us? And I'd like you to leave the session feeling a bit more comfortable with tools to do this, either existing ones you have and we're going to show you ones that we developed as part of this training. Because this is a challenging situation in which to use our ethical frameworks. We've got very vulnerable patients and families. Things are happening fast. We're not familiar with the setting. There isn't equal access to resources. Many of you work in settings where there is never equal access to resources. And I think sometimes those of us used to that are not finding it so much of a challenge as some of those from high income settings who shared their experience. Holistic issues are often ignored. And if we ignore the holistic issues, it makes this whole decision making much harder. There's stigma, there's fear. We use words like suspects um, and people are under extreme pressure in some situations, really very extreme pressure. So making balanced ethical decision making is hard. Let us try and work through the ethical thinking so when you're in the situation, you can apply the tools and move forward and not get too paralyzed uh, by the situation. Okay, we're going to meet this patient. And, uh, and as we start to think of the issues, I'm then going to ask Dr. Rupin in a moment to come in and say what you're telling us. So Ramesh is, is an elderly man of 75. He has diabetes, he has ischemic heart disease, he has obesity, hypertension, and unfortunately had a severe stroke that has left him with a dense hemiplegia and frequent chest infections. He's largely housebound and needs help with most daily tasks. 
and presently is cared for his wife and daughters-in-law and sons. So what are the issues that are going to help us decide the way forward? This is before this gentleman is exposed to COVID. What are the issues that are going to help us decide the way forward as far as treatment interventions are concerned? Dr. Rube, do you want to just see what's coming up in the chat for that? Yeah, so um, there was a, a mention of the uh, four main ethical principles and um, someone brought up the question of uh, futility. Um, though, uh, would you want to, uh, Dr. Moira, would you want to speak on how we take futility a little later, uh, but first look at beneficence and uh, non-maleficence? So we'll not look at the principles themselves, we'll look at the application. So what, what issues, not ethical issues, but just, you know, you've got this scenario, this is not an unusual scenario, I think, for many of you, an elderly person with comorbidities. You're in a COVID pandemic. Are there anything in this scenario that's going to help you if this gentleman does get exposed to and become COVID positive? What are the issues in this scenario that are going to help you when it comes to making decisions? And as you're thinking of that, thank you for Dr. Mazunder. That's very helpful. So you're telling us that we are not required to do things to patients or families or to offer treatments which are not going to help. So very important. We need to be in the best interests. So family support, Sonali, thank you. So family, there is family support to you. That's very important. Anything else in this scenario that is going to be significant when we look at uh, COVID-19? Um, do you also look at, sorry, do you also look at uh, uh, the patient as an individual or do we look at him in his setting? Okay, as a so that's very nice. So we're looking at this patient as an individual in their context. I've just seen someone tell in the chat has said that uh, the patient may be able to still communicate their issues very importantly. So do we know now what he thought? Or do we know from before if people are using something like an advanced directive? Thank you so much. Yeah, because he's, uh, he's, he's hemiplegic, but he's not aphasic and he can communicate. Great. So we can find out the patient's point of view. We know there's family support. Any other issues in this scenario which are going to give us some clues about disease intervention if this gentleman was to get COVID? You may be anxious about it. Yes. Right. Great. So we need to look at the holistic issues that might be there. He may be already very anxious and maybe people round about him are anxious. Thank you for that. Okay. So uh, having come this far, uh, we need to look at uh, his perspective. Uh, if it is possible, then uh, you do need to ask him uh, in case he does get ill, what would he look forward for? So I'm seeing some nice things in the chat. Exactly what you're saying, put the patient's desires first, but I'm also seeing you saying he has a lot of comorbidities. So we do have to look at their point of view in balanced with the comorbidities and the expectations. Aha, very nice Dr. Sonali, I like that. We are going to proactively manage the problems we see. And this is one of the points I'm really glad you brought up because sometimes we're so worried about what we'll do if he gets COVID-19. Maybe this gentleman is struggling to get his medication because of the lockdown, because of the lack of access to healthcare. Maybe there's a financial issue. Maybe there's an issue of people are buying food and not medicine. So let's optimize what is happening right now. Let's remember the comorbidities and the pre-morbid function is going to be important when we make decisions later if he does develop COVID. Let's find out as much as we can. Now, that means, can we have conversations with him and his family if we know this patient already? Do we have to wait until a COVID-19 discussion comes in? And if you are in family medicine, if you are looking after people like this in your clinics, it's really important we start these conversations early. So we don't find ourselves having all of the conversations right at the moment when things are very critical and very difficult to make decisions at times. So thank you so much for that. Okay, and I, I'm really seeing that you're saying to reduce unnecessary visits, but you are already asking the question, should we escalate as far as ventilation for this gentleman? Let's look at the next slide. Thank you for that. What do we know? We're not going to go through this in, in huge detail, but we know that the elderly 
uh, are not doing so well when it comes to um, when it comes to survival. Here's a, a, a study from the UK, um, and it's showing that as you become more elderly, the chances of you surviving and being discharged from an intensive care setting are very slim. Now, of course, this is only looking at mechanical ventilation, isn't it? There's many other ways in which we can offer treatments, but this is the one that everybody's been worried for. So I'm going to ask you another question. In Italy, in the early days of the pandemic, people were very anxious and they said, okay, everyone who, has, um, who is over the age of 70, we will not uh, put on a ventilator. I just want a, a, a thought from you, is that good? or not good good or not good saying everybody over the age of 70 they were running out of ventilators so they said everybody over 70 let's not ventilate in one area is that good or not good what's your thinking not good good a couple of not goods okay okay so this was one of our learning points that um that came because people were uh, overwhelmed. They had ventilated everybody and now they were stuck. So let's see, you're telling me you wanted to be a more nuanced decision. You're telling me you wanted to be, uh, it's not good to never ventilate, but uh, there are some individual issues we should take into account. Okay, let's look at that a bit further. Thank you so much for that. We're, when we look at ethical principles, go and find these briefings. They're very helpful. These are produced by all the global palliative care organizations. Many of the faculty involved in Pali COVID Kerala and Pali India have been part of these briefings. And I love the fact that the very first reminder they're telling us is don't abandon the patient. So elderly who felt abandoned, family members who feel you're abandoning their, their relative are going to find this really very hard. We need to continue to respect people. and take on, core, on board those ethical principles along with whole patient care. Some settings we work in have a very well-developed system for doing this. This is Kerala, where they used a lot of the experience and expertise from the floods, from the Nipah virus, to very quickly roll out um, community engagement and COVID-19 response, which included palliative care. That's a little unusual, and it's a credit to Kerala, and that you can read more about. But we need to think about our goals of care early on. Here's a diagram you have in your ebook. It's not so easy to see on screen, but it's basically saying that if you're under age 60 with no comorbidities, it's pretty straightforward. We should be communicating openly, managing holistic patients and moving through. However, if you are in the older bracket and you have multiple comorbidities and you have severe symptoms and you are deteriorating, this is where we may need to be thinking about our goals of care quite carefully going to go to the next slide because this helps us more. This is, I think, is one of the most useful algorithms. I hope you find it useful. Print it out, find it in your ebook. And the way this takes you through, the green boxes are the more straightforward scenarios. So someone that is, is uh, no comorbidities and is doing relatively uh, well, we continue with the standard management that you have in your setting. And that will include decisions on disease escalation. Although remember nowadays, we're not ventilating everyone. We're trying to manage with high, vent high dose oxygen and even with CPAP and ventilation is not something that we're doing as a early intervention. However, here we have our patient. Yeah, somebody with significant comorbidities. And then we're beginning to say, are they likely or unlikely to benefit? Do you, do you think Ramesh, with the, the setting I've told you, his comorbidities, his pre market function, is likely to benefit or not benefit. So just if you think he would benefit from ventilatory support, please put benefit in the chat. And uh, Dr. Rupp can keep an eye on that and tell me. So put benefit in the chat if you think he would benefit from going down this yellow pathway and getting uh, referred on for ventilatory support. Okay, so not many of you think he will. And I agree with you. We can use some tools here. The tool we're suggesting is WHO performance status. And if your performance status four or five, then that along with um, comorbidities, the poor pre-morbid function state, is a very clear indicator of being unlikely to benefit. And this is where it's tricky because if we think someone is unlikely to benefit, we need to discuss as a team, we need to be clear we need to take that person as an individual, but then we need to start communicating with the team and documenting, sorry, with the patient and family 
and documenting that discussion. This is where the concept of futility is coming in. So we're not saying we're withholding a treatment that should help. We're saying that actually the, the benefit is just not there. So now we're talking much more about how can we manage the situation as it is, and if there's a deterioration, how do we manage that well? Doing excellent holistic care support and doing excellent symptom management. Uh, Rupa, any, any comments that are coming up in the chat about that? Yeah, people are generally agreeing that there's not much benefit for uh, Ramesh from the from ventilatory support. But then we ask, we, we'll go on. I mean, as we go on, I think we'll add more. Okay, want me to go on? Yeah. So this is summarizing what we've said. Communicate, document, be aware of this issue of futility and involve our colleagues for further escalation if the patient we think can benefit, but make sure that we are doing good symptom control and those issues will come up. This is the WHO performance scale. I think most of you are familiar with it. Three and four here are people who are spending um, just under or over 50% of the day unable to be anything other than in a bed. Some settings are using these scales. This is one, the, the SOFA scale is used often in ICU. And um, you may be familiar with it. This was a scale that was used very widely in Europe and in the UK, something called a clinical frailty scale. And this brings in the concept of someone who has a very advanced chronic illness, regardless of age, as well as the, the other frailty aspects. Okay, so looking at those, this is telling us that he's, he is the highest level on the WHO performance scale. That means he's got the poorest function and he also scores very highly on all of these. So we would medically not expect this gentleman to benefit from escalation, but we of course have to have these conversations. Very high risk of poor response. Because families are families, you told me that. And we now know a little more about Ramesh. He's a mechanic, he lives with his wife. Uh, his Suresh is running a provision store. Begin to think of what issues might be there for this family. The other son has just returned from a job in the Gulf and they're on quarantine in two small rooms. And neighbors are telling him, you're not going to get treated. So you mentioned these earlier, didn't you? You mentioned stigma. You mentioned the concerns um, about the anxiety, but here's another one. What do, what do we do for this issue of the, the family all living together? Any suggestions how we should manage this issue? Aha, financial crisis, thank you. So probably there's no work coming in from here. Probably there's no food and work coming in from here. There's no work coming in from here. And this is a very big reality for our patients in all settings actually. Thank you for that. So we need to be thinking of how to respond to all of these concerns. Maybe Manish, is he feeling a little bit guilty because he's been away? Fear of death, thank you. Isolation, absolutely. These are very, very helpful feel of abandonment. This, he's terrified of being abandoned. Uh, Rup, do you want to just say anything else that's coming up in the... Yeah, so fear of death. Um isolation, uh, financial, um, all these issues will come up. I think one more issue that you need to think about is uh, Manish has just returned from the Gulf and he might be worried that was he the one to bring the infection in? So there might be some guilt in there as well. Yeah. Great. I'm going to just leave some of those issues there because we're going to meet this gentleman again and you're going to be able to discuss some of these issues more thoroughly as we go. So let us just uh, begin to close off this session. We need to be present. That's what I meant about the bearing witness. So thank you for, for reminding of that. Even in an ICU setting, using our verbal and nonverbal skills, you'll, you'll, you'll cover more of that on the communication session. Remembering to work as teams, trying to preserve this continuum of care, even in a pandemic. And uh, you've covered most of this for me already. But I want to just touch on in the last few minutes, the issue of our humanity. This is a long story. Let me summarize it for you. This is a, a Italian ICU doctor speaking to a, a New York doctor, talking about how hard it is to stay human in these settings. The Italian doctor saying, I almost like need to feel numb in order to do this. 
and the, the, the American doctor saying that I'm used to pushing the mortality to the edge, never giving up, and now I feel helpless. We need to recognize this in ourselves. The wonderful thing about palliative care, it is a framework where we can say, even when we can't solve the problem, there is so much we can do. We are bearing witness, we are coming in with excellent communication, helping with decision making, looking at the holistic issues, managing the symptoms, not being afraid to talk about and deal with end of life care issues. All of those skills are things we can do. And in this scenario, they come to the point of saying, staying painful, human is painful, but it's what I need to keep on working. I have a student in Gaza who was talking about, I taught them palliative care. And I said, what do you think this means for you and your day-to-day -day work? This is not palliative care specialist. This is a medical student. He said, I think this is humanity until infinity. And I want to just leave that idea with you. How do we show that humanity in this setting? And this week we'll discuss it. How do we, yes, physically distance, but stay together socially and globally? And how do we help people uh, take these very important moments of saying goodbye if that is the right uh, time and stage in the scenario? So I'm going to stop there. Um, you have these slides and you can get them in your resource. Uh, any last comments or questions from people? including Dr. Roop, please do be yeah. highlighting things that you're wanting to come up. So Nali, thank you for sharing that. Yeah, it is hard to stay human, isn't it? What I would say is that it is hard, but it's also a place of great richness because in that space, because life and death and the cycles of that are common to all of us, how we make sense of it's important, whether we lose hope, looking at our spiritual lives and the spirituality of the people we care for, all of these are really important issues uh, going forward. But maybe we'll just pick up on that issue. How do we stay human? Any, anybody else, any suggestions we, do about, we, we can do for that? So, uh, anybody? No, nobody's coming yet on this. So, if we if we need to maintain, if we need to maintain our humanity, um, I think recognize that uh, the patient needs communication. So does the family. Um, and as you are going through this decision making. Sorry, is there a problem with my voice? Uh, yes, sir. No, we can hear you. Uh, Some distance yeah, my, coming in. Yeah, yeah. Even I can hear it. Yeah. So, Dr. Moira, I think just I'll just set right my connection. I think it might be okay. Let me summarize that for you then. As Dr. Rupa is just sorting out, so we've come to a really interesting issue. We have some time now for discussion. We have some time to discuss the case the issues of triage and how we do that. And we also have some time to look at this issue of how we uh, maintain our common humanity. And um, we also have some time to pick up on issues going forward that you want to make sure we cover. So please let's use the chat. We'll use the faculty, put the slides off so that we don't always have to look at slides. So this is now a time to tease out these issues and to discuss them and to see what we can do together. And thank you, let me see what we see there. Okay, Deepak, you're talking about putting yourself in the place of the patient. Thank you. That is, in a sense, what empathy is, putting ourselves in the place of the patient. Now, we can't fully do that, although COVID-19 has touched many of us. And I wonder, even as we're discussing just now, how many of you know someone who has been directly impacted by COVID-19 or by a palliative care issue? Compassion is said to be when we go one step further and we actually almost like suffer with someone. These are difficult concepts. I don't know how you would explain empathy or uh, in your settings. It'd be nice to see what people feel. So Deepak, you're also saying that compartmentalizing work and suffering makes health workers cope. It's an interesting one that compartmentalizing. I'm really looking forward to seeing what other people are saying. The trouble with compartmentalizing is then we can feel a bit fractured. Maybe we need to compartmentalize the work, but do we need to compartmentalize the humanity? That's a tricky one. Or do we need to actually find our non-work space, ways in which we build ourselves up in order to go back into our workspace? What do you think? Right. 
I see Dr. Raji is on this call. Dr. Raji, could you just make a comment about expressing entomy, empathy? I think the voice is this. Dr. Rup, is your 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 working? Yeah, I'm, yeah, it's working. So let me let me ask everybody. Do you think talking about these issues uh, makes sense? Like, uh, I mean, you've been through a bad day with a bad patient. Uh, do you think discussing it with your team, uh, letting your emotions flow, do you think that helps? What does everybody think? Because we are used to not showing our emotions. And sometimes even to, uh, you know, making maybe a joke out of being callous. But there are times when it is important to accept that we are also hurting. So thank you so much for that. I'm seeing some great suggestions here. So people are saying how we need to balance and know ourselves. Some of us get over involved and, and, and actually get so exhausted that we can't look after the next person. Others are struggling and need to find ways to connect. We've heard a very practical issue from, I think, the Philippines, that when you were hot and stuck in your PPE, and you want to show compassion, how do we do that? Uh, you've said it's a very big dilemma, and it truly is. Any suggestions for our colleague there in the Philippines? When we are stuck in PPE, we're adding that extra layer of distancing. How do we show compassion and empathy? I'm also seeing, as you're answering that question, I'm seeing some great answers about the importance of venting. Have situations, whether it's professional colleagues, whether it's uh, specific people in your, your, your non-work life that you can vent, that you can share some of these emotions with. Absolutely, very, very important. Sometimes doing it as a team. Some teams are deliberately having, building some reflection or some team building into their day so that there's moments to be able to acknowledge that. Or even just moments to remember the, the things in life like the new babies and the, uh, the weddings and the, the joys of life in the midst of difficulty. Any suggestions for our colleague with his PPE? Okay, so Retail, you're saying we should use gestures. Thank you. Aha, Deepak, nice. Just sitting for a moment. This presence is really very, very, very powerful. Don't underestimate that your best therapeutic tool is yourself, is the way in which you're present. If you're present in a kind of, I've, I've got to go and it's very busy, but if you can just, even if it's just for 30 seconds, one minute, give the impression to that person that you are really listening to them, that their situation is really important. They're not just bed number five with COVID-19 and an oxygen saturation of 92. And in that moment, you're recognizing them for the person they are with their human experience. Sometimes it's nice to be even ask about that. What was life what like for you before? Well, what is, uh, tell me the names of your grandchildren. Just things that let people realize that you see them as a human being. Uh, Dr. Roop, feel free to come in as you're reading here, but I'm seeing, aha, that's interesting. So Dr. Dr. Vinayak uh, said uh, we need clarity on thoughts. What are we communicating and then explaining both sides? Yes, so uh, I mean, at this point, uh, as far as prognosis is concerned, that is something that perhaps can be saved for discussing with the family. With the patient, you may need just that presence. It may not, uh, your, uh, at this point, it's quite possible that uh, uh, it may be a little difficult to communicate much more detail to uh, Ramesh, except to ask him. Um, and, and one of the questions that you can ask him is, is look at his symptoms, ask him for uh, uh, whether he's at peace. Thank you, Rup. And you know, as I'm reading the comment, somebody said smiling helps and immediately it made me smile. I don't know if you saw, immediately it made me smile. So those human to human contexts. Some of you have also mentioned the need for counselors. Uh, do you have counselors in your setting? You can use your reactions now. Can you see these reactions? If you've got access to counselors in your setting or to psychologists, please can you just give me an indication on that? How many of you have access to counselors in your setting? Just put a tick. Uh, I'm not seeing so many. So that is a challenge. I think if we, we did have better access to counsellors, that would certain, certainly help. 
Anything else people have found helpful in their sitting? Video calls during the ward rounds, hugely important in many, many settings. And even in low income settings, we're seeing this actually helping. Delegation, some people are talking about. Don't feel everything is on your shoulders alone. Some people, I like that, talking about just being present by your side. I'll just tell you a brief story from my early days of, of coming into medicine. I'm a physician, a background physician. I was doing respiratory medicine. I looked after a patient who was very breathless, who was holding onto the table, who was desperate to breathe. And that I felt really bad because I didn't know how to help his breathlessness. I also thought he had some unusual complication. I thought he had ectopic ACTH. I was on a uh, professorial ward, so I uh, was getting a lot of, of compliments by my seniors for being so bright to notice this interesting medical phenomenon. And they gave me a lot of congratulations. I had to check it out. I said, what shall we do for his breathing? Oh no, check out the medicine and the, med the blood results first. I checked them out. I was right. I had been a very clever doctor. And then they said, how is the patient? I said, the patient died last night. I was quite a young doctor. I felt terrible. I felt as though we'd all been focusing on the medical aspects. Meanwhile, this person was breathless and we didn't help him. So I went to his wife and actually I was going to apologize to her. I was going to say to her, I am so sorry that we never helped your relative. And when I walked in, she said, doctor, so glad you're here. You really helped my husband. I said, I helped him? How did I help him? She told me every time you came, you didn't miss him out. You smiled. You, he showed you the photographs of his life. Uh, you said to him, I'm so sorry I, that you're still breathless. Let me see if there's anything I can do. So even though I didn't solve it, I still was actually showing empathy for his concerns. Yeah. And that taught me two things. It taught me, number one, I needed to train in palliative care because I needed to know how to manage his breathlessness. And tomorrow you'll look at that. But it also taught me that the way I interact with someone is also a very powerful therapeutic intervention. Dr. Rup, any others you can see coming from the chat that you want to pick up? Um, no, so uh, can everybody think about what specific skills that they would like to um, identify as they go through this course? And are there any skills that uh, you particularly think that you might want to follow on uh, after this course is over too. So just a quick yeah. comment on that. Thank you, Rup. And I think just before we move on to that, let's just acknowledge some of the things people have said. Great one, hands gestures. Children, play is vital for children. Children who are patients, children who are siblings. We meet children in so many different varieties. Sometimes we just think of them as patients, but they're also siblings and therefore part of the care that we should be giving. So thank you for reminding us about that. You've got an intercom. That's great uh, to talk to patients once or twice a day. Excellent. Um, toys have come up a few times, really important. I know it's difficult about spreading the virus. I don't know if you have some solutions to that. I know some people have allowed one toy that stays inside the room and doesn't come out again. Have any of you got any solutions how you've managed to support children in that setting? Some units have toys that they can sterilize. They had this in Gaza, for example, for their leukemia patients, and that toy then stayed inside the room. Any suggestions on that for others? Um, daily video calls, excellent. Okay, excellent. I want to ask two questions before we finish. Number one, do you feel comfortable using this triage algorithm? And if not, what would help you feel more comfortable? Number two, what are the issues you've come on this course saying, I really hope we don't miss out these as the week goes on? So two questions for you. Are you feeling comfortable managing uh, a triage decision making? Or do we need to go over anything from that session? And secondly, what are the issues you would like to see coming up as we go on to explore this fascinating idea of us being human and compassionate and yet also offering our medical care with that in mind. So if we can just cover those two issues. So what are the boundaries? Okay, so Nali, that's a very important question. Yeah. For pediatric patients. So, so uh, I wonder if our colleagues who've mentioned that we didn't, we saw apart from the, this diagram that we showed you is, is actually for all ages because it's for 
under 60 and over 60. So normally for those under 60, it's relatively straightforward. If there are significant comorbidities, then that comes into the discussion. And children, as we know at the moment, are not being as commonly affected by COVID-19, but when they are affected, they're getting an unusual Kawasaki-type inflammatory illness, which is proving very difficult to manage. Um, and it would be nice to hear from our colleagues who are working in pediatrics just how they are handling those. So in general, people are being escalated for treatment if they're in, if they are children, and being really quite intensively managed if they show signs of this uh, probably cytokine-driven inflammatory process, which is mimicking um, another autoimmune illness called uh, uh, inflammatory illness called Kawasaki's disease. I also, there's a question here about the boundaries of palliative care. Thank you for that. Um, you're asking a question that's a very, very relevant one. What we're saying nowadays is that palliative care is relevant for people who have serious health-related suffering. That comment, that, that uh, phraseology has come from the Lancet Commission, and it's trying to identify those who are unwell, seriously unwell, and who are suffering. Suffering in the psychological, the social, the, the, the um, spiritual or in the physical domains. Now, does that mean everybody needs to see a specialist physician? Not at all. We are doing research in different parts of the world, but most palliative care will happen as interventions by their core clinical teams in family practice, in the community setting, in various hospital settings. So for example, in Uganda, we're training everyone in pediatrics, everyone in internal medicine, everyone in oncology to have those core palliative care skills so that when they have people with chronic illnesses, it becomes part and parcel of their care or integrated into their care. And it could be that this pandemic is going to act as a, as a stimulus for that, to really make sure that we're not left with the medical knowledge and not the holistic skills. There are times when you need some backup, when there are particularly complex patients that in, in pediatrics and in adult care, and you need someone who can deal with a particularly problematic scenario or give you advice or help you with your training on site or develop algorithms and management for your settings. And that's where people with specialist skills come in. So I would like you all to feel that you can do palliative care in your settings. This course will introduce you to that. And there are other trainings you can have. Some people have done those already. There are excellent sites. Those of you who are pediatricians, um, I wonder if someone can put in the chat the link for the International Children's Palliative Care Network. I may even be able to quickly share it here. This is a phenomenal um, network, which has excellent, here we go here. I think you see this. And then just the briefing notes. Here we, international. No, we'll maybe put the we'll put the link on for you. So somebody can look up ICPCN um, and put the link on. That gives uh, really helpful information. It also gives some advanced training options. So this is an introductory course to really help you get uh, started on putting these skills into your COVID-19 response. Um, but it also has wider implications. There are courses and programs run by Palim India. There are also excellent uh, e-learning. And modules that you can do through the International Children's Palliative Care Network, and you can do those online. So please do look at that. Thank you, Deepak, for sharing that, and thank you, Smitty. So this is an interest. I like this question. Um, is humanity? Can we teach humanity? I'm going to pick on someone who doesn't is not waiting for me to pick on them, and ask them to comment on that. I think I'm going to ask Smitty. Smithy, can we teach humanity or not? I had a feeling that would come to me. Um, <laughs> I saw your smile. <laughs> I think um, everybody has the potential. And uh, okay. sometimes it's a matter of streamlining. And, uh, yes, I think it can be taught. I think uh, there are lots of uh, courses that talk about value-based learning. About, uh, I mean, so much of what we do, Moira, in fact, uh, is, is not so much a teaching, it's a information of what is already what we think perhaps is like someone said we compartmentalize and here we're talking about the fact that you don't need to compartmentalize humanity so it's about bringing it into your practice rather than teaching it i think so i think dr roop uh, also in person uh, figuring out what makes us human i, I remember him saying that to me 
that he's in the lifelong pursuit of figuring out what makes us human. So I'm going to now pass the baton on to you to, to comment on this question. So uh, I think we realize that uh, some of us are comfortable showing our vulnerability and uh, some of us are not. And it's okay. Uh, as long as you recognize where you can and where you cannot. But what is most important is that uh, when you're dealing with a patient, you recognize their humanity. I'm sorry, am I lost? I think I am. Perfect. Yeah. Did no, I, I drop out? In the... We could hear you. Yeah. Can I circle back again to the medical ethics uh, questions that we raised right in the uh, midway through this? And just, uh, we just were almost out of time, Dr. Oh, yeah, Rook. Yeah, yeah. yeah. almost minutes. out of time, but maybe they can come up in another session. And uh, just picking up what you just said there is very important. Are we human? Yes. Do we have different ways of showing our humanity? Yes. Does palliative care sometimes, does healthcare sometimes squeeze out? Our ability to express that? Yes. So that's why the medical student is saying humanity to infinity. So it's about almost giving ourselves permission to rediscover our own humanity out with our work setting, whatever that means, to, to, work, to, to make sure that we are restored, to think of ways that, that build us up, and then to bring into our work setting our clinical skills, and our humanity. And that will express itself in different ways. And I love what Dr. Rook says, we must see the other person as fully human. But what I just say to you, my adventure in palliative care, I've been in palliative care for 30 years. Actually, the adventure for me is that it, this enriches me, engaging with someone else's uh, humanity, realizing I'm not there to solve all their problems, but I am there to support and to help and to be alongside them is one of the most enriching experiences I can have. And that's why after 35 years of palliative care, I still say I love working in this area, not I'm exhausted by working in this area. Does that make some sense? Can be exhausting at times, but also can be incredibly enriching. And um, I think your point there about shared vulnerability, shared vulnerability does not mean emotionalism. Mm -hmm does not mean that. It can mean something like, this must be hard for you. Where do you go to for hope and strength when times are difficult? Yeah. So those are the sorts of issues that can bring up the humanity. You know, it must be hard being here alone. Who is it that you miss when you're here? So it can be quite a process question you ask. It doesn't have to be an emotional question, but it's a question that recognizes the concerns and the importance of the person that you're speaking to. In fact, if you are breaking down being very emotional with patients, I would just say that maybe you need to look at your own uh, support systems and actually have people in your team or out with that can help you with that. So emotionalism is not the same as um, empathy and compassion. I think, uh, Smithy, are we are we nearly done there? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. I just want to say a huge thank you to my co-facilitator, um, but also to all of you. You've really got into this chat. We really feel as though you're sharing what you are thinking, and we're going to be able to carry on doing that the rest of the week. So thank you so much. Over to you. Thank you for us uh, setting up or setting us up on the journey so beautifully. Uh, just a couple of things before people check out. Uh, just some housekeeping uh, uh, concerns. I see that a lot of you have alphanumerics. In it's really important for your attendance to be registered that your names are displayed. If you have some trouble figuring that out, please write to us. We'll tell you how to fix that. Uh, but not having your names displayed is difficult. Or you can enter it in the chat box and we will rename you from here. So that's one thing. Please do that. Um, also, uh, please note that we have a, a, a pre uh, test uh, questionnaire, uh, which is uh, would be important for us for you to fill in. It's not to test you; it's to also test at the end of the course how effective we have been uh, in uh, in bringing all this material to you. So please do fill in that uh, questionnaire. And there is a little poll coming up now. It'll show up on your screen. Uh, it's a feedback poll. Um, please stay, fill that in, and then check out. Thank you so much, and we will see you tomorrow at the.